Welcome back, everyone, to Let's Play Enemy Zero. Last time, we had a very cool, collected conversation with George about what we found on his computer when we put David's chip in there, and he did not want to answer any of our questions. I mean, he did do us a favor by saving us from one of the aliens who, you know, had its tentacle in Laura's mouth, which, if you remember D2, that does seem to kind of a thing, I guess, that Kenji Ino was into. But, uh, yeah, George did not want to answer any of our questions. What does Laura think about that? Voice record number 01D, Laura Lewis. From a microchip recovered from David's body, I have come to understand that he was constructed by George. David was a robotics product of a company called Vex Technologies, which was developed specifically for the purpose of capturing the XGIL enemy, which, in turn, were to be used as biological weaponry. I will now proceed towards the Fall Tower in order to escape from this horrifying spacecraft. Well, it seems that things are coming together. This uh, Vex company, I suppose, was the one. Not only that created David, but I suppose we're the ones that commissioned the mission to get this alien and bring it back to Earth to use as a bioweapon, which, you know, science fiction corporations, they do that. You shouldn't expect that they won't. Looks like George dropped a key when he rushed out of here. Yep, there it is. Well, we haven't seen many keyholes in this ship, but there is one that we saw. You know, if you're working for a big science fiction corporation, you should just expect that at some part, bioweapons are going to come into it. thats It's just a given. It's just at some point they're going to say, this is a really good idea. Let's capture the super strong, uncontrollable monsters and use them as weapons. Because you know what the, the quality of the best kind of weapon is? It's the kind you can't control. I mean, everyone wants that in a weapon. It's just the thrill, you know, of not entirely knowing when it's going to turn on you. You know, a plain old gun, you know, I'm sure that if you've ever fired a gun, the thing that's going through your mind is, you know, if only there was a chance this thing would turn around and shoot me. Because that, it gives it a lot more excitement. So, I mean, it's, bioweapons are just a thing that's going to come up at some point when you're working for the evil sci-fi corporation. All right, this was already entered. Let's go in. We don't know where George went off to, but I guess it doesn't matter right now. Though that does bring the remaining uh, survivors down to two, or at least that we know of. We still don't know where Kimberly is. We do know that George was working on a key for the Fall Tower, which is where the mini spaceship is, so even if we're arguing with George, he does have something that we need. But for right now, though, this computer does have a keyhole. Might as well try it out.
not good. Not good at all. Even if I return to the company, there's no promotion with a mess like this. Ah. You see, the whole reason we went to that star was to capture the monsters, the enemy, and bring them back to Earth. To sell them to the military as biological weapons at a big profit. I was actually against the idea. No good can come out of getting involved in something like that. So, tell me, what does it feel like, you know, to find out that you are not human? Yes, Laura. You and David are androids. The company put you on this ship to assist us as well as monitor our progress. I implanted your memory chip with a variety of recollections and facts. The color of the sky, the name of the birds, the price of a subway ticket, how to calculate the area of a triangle, fond childhood memories of your mother and your father, even about the unforgettable time in your hometown when you stretched out your arms to hug that oak tree. All of it, everything, I gave to you. I implanted these different memories so that you would be more human-like. And in the end, your real memory, the fact that you are an android, was erased. Not good. Not good at all. Even if the company found out, that you found out, my career is over. I have to reprogram your memory again. Don't move. Stay still. Hey, wait. Right, so I think that Laura and George are going to see... They're just going to have different opinions on this matter, the whole reprogramming your memory thing. I, I, I don't think Laura is all for it, but George feels that there's no point in her believe in her knowing that she's an android. Well, I guess let's get let's get uh, Laura's thoughts on that. Voice record number 01E, Laura Lewis. It is now clear that I too am an android. Moreover, I have discovered something peculiar in the nape of my neck. I believe it to be a wound sustained in a confrontation with the enemy. Yeah, I'm wondering which is she more shocked about? The fact that she's an android, or that she has an alien in her neck? I couldn't tell from her reaction which was the bigger shock. Because they're both a big deal. Alright, where are we going? Well, do you remember that I mentioned a while back that I said that a thing about Kenji Ino's games is that he does like to sort of pad out the length of the game by trying to make things maybe not clear as to what you should be doing. Here's one of those times. Where do you think we should be going? We've had a pretty clear path up to now, but now we've run away from George, and we don't know what to do. Are there any rooms that we could go to? I mean, we haven't gone to the power room yet, but do we have a reason to go there? Not really. I guess the only thing we could really do right now is just maybe just go back to David's room. Well, that's the other way around, actually. Go back to David's room and reminisce about the good times. The good times before Laura knew that she and David were androids and all their crewmates were dead and David was also dead. Those good times. Let's think about those. You can't dwell on, on the bad points, you know? You have to find the silver lining. It's not clear as to what that is yet, but I'm sure it'll come up at some point. Laura, it's okay. Come on over here. There's nothing to worry about. Everything will be fine. I'm just going to restore you to your former human self. Don't you get it? If you stay like this, you'll be living the rest of your life as an android. Come on. I'll also remove your painful memories of David. Well, come on. <laughs>
this is becoming a pattern. Okay, so that leaves Laura on her own, with the possible exception of Kimberly. Everyone else? Well, everyone else has been killed. I guess let's listen to what Laura thinks about it. Voice record number 01F, Laura Lewis. George is dead. I am now the only remaining crew member. Yeah, she doesn't... She's not saying much. I think that she's sort of, uh... Maybe she's sort of acclimated to it by now. So, I mean, I guess the only thing to do is what we always do, and that's search the body. All right, he had some kind of blood-covered disc on him. We can actually search him a second time. I like that little jet engine sound when she put her hand in his pocket. All right, what do we get? Uh, we got... Well, we got these two things. We don't know what this is, but it's a second piece of paper. Right, there's the first one. So we have two long pieces of paper. Don't we don't know what these are. And by the way, there's really no indication that you're supposed to come back here. This was actually a frustrating thing my first time through the game. There's really no nothing that uh that indicates you're supposed to go back to Dave's room. You just have to wander around until you eventually come back in here just because there's nothing else to do. But if you don't come back in here, well that cutscene never happens and you can't advance. All right, what should we do? Well, we can't use the video phone because everyone's dead. Let's uh, look at the database. Maybe we can find out what this thing is that we picked up from George. Yep, there we go. It's the key disc. It's needed to operate the elevator. The original key is blue, copy is yellow. All right, well, whatever. All we know is that it's a key. And, uh... Well, we know that George was making a key for the fall tower, right? So, I guess I guess he finished. I guess we have it now. It's a shame that George is never going to be able to use it himself, but you know, at least someone's going to be able to use it. George seemed to think it would be a terrible thing to live on knowing that Laura is an android. That the preferable thing would be for her to be repro reprogrammed so she thought she was a human and live her life that way. Um, I wonder if that's true. What would you think about that? What, do you th what would your choice be? to go back thinking you're a human, or just go on knowing you're an android. I mean, if if she went on thinking she was human, that's gonna probably cause some problems some point in the future. Knowing that she's an android, however, I guess there might be some issues if she gets back to Earth. What does she do at that point? How does she integrate into human society being an android? What? What was she even doing with her life before she actually went on this mission? George said that he invented all of her memories. So that would include the memories she had before the mission. I guess that would also be the case with David. Were they actually activated before the mission at all? 
Hmm, we don't know. Let's head down to the first floor. As that's where the door to the fall tower is. So as we find more as we find out more about Laura that she's an android we actually find out less about her. We don't actually know what her history or her past was before going on this mission. Maybe she was built for the mission. Maybe she had no life at all before the Aki. Well, we have what we need for this. Hopefully the blood doesn't uh, make it malfunction. Well, it looks like we finally found the thing that needs power. We've seen that there's a power room to this tower, but we didn't see anything that actually needed power. We finally have found it, and it is the elevator to the fall tower. Just gotta go back and turn that power on. So that was the sixth floor. Which would be two and four. I guess this also explains George's uh, interest in Laura and David's love life. After all, if you built two androids and they were just built to be, you know, crew members, and they started falling in love and displaying romantic tendencies, you'd probably think that was kind of weird. You'd probably be wondering, hey, what's going on? I didn't die, didn't program them for this. But they're doing it anyway. You can't stop them. Emergent behavior. All right, here we are on the power floor. This is a maze, so let's hug the left wall. It works so well for us so many times. This is a pretty large maze, actually, too. But if we just hug the left wall, we should be okay. Ah, but we're not alone on this floor. Can't tell. Oh, oh no, there it came through the door. That door just opened. Okay, we actually got a visual cue of where it was this time. We actually did see it come through a door into the corridor. I'm still not sure what the crew of this ship would have needed this earpiece for. 
aside from detecting aliens. I mean, sure, it's kind of neat to have a thing that emits pings whenever someone's around. You wouldn't think it would be that useful. Aside from this one specific instance of invisible aliens. Alright, so now that we've, we're have we looking at this, and this might look familiar. Because we have this. Now, the dials need to match the directions on this paper. And that's the harder way to do it. The easier way is if we search George a second time, we get this paper. And it gives us actual numbers. 180, negative 90, 0, 135. Okay, so let's remember those numbers and take a look at this thing. All right, the first one was 180. Let's plug that in. And now that turns around to match the direction that it's on the paper. So if I was using the paper, I would just have to eyeball this instead of being able to plug in numbers. The second number was negative 90. There's no negative sign on here, though, so I'm going to uh, subtract uh, 90 from 360 to make 270. And that'll turn that around. The third one was zero. Let's just skip past it. And the last one, I think, was 135. All that just to power one elevator. This doesn't seem very efficient, but then again, the Aki does not seem like an efficient design, does it? It's kind of shaped like an apple. And I've never seen a spaceship that looked like that before. Usually when you see spaceships, they're a bit more, you know, ergonomic, a bit more aerodynamic, instead of just looking like an apple with four towers coming out the top of it. I'm sure there's a reason behind the design. It's an apple. It's carrying the seeds of aliens back to Earth. I mean, I don't I don't know if that's the intention. That seems like something that you would see in a sci-fi story. That seems like the kind of symbolism you would see. And, but this apple, it's gone bad. It's gone rotten. So we have to smash it, unfortunately. All right, now that the power has been restored, that entire generator just for the one elevator. Let's head back to the first floor and head over to the fall tower. The fall tower, of course, being where the escape ship is. So, and that does seem like it is our ultimate destination. Let's head over to the Fall Tower, and then we can say goodbye to this apple. Once we find the actual ship first, of course. There's that. And then we can say goodbye to the apple. Do I have to use this again? Let's see. No, I don't have it. Should be able to go right... Do I need to... Yeah, the animation's playing again. It didn't look like I had the disc, though.
Wait, let me take a look at that again. Did I just go right by it or something? I don't see it. I can't have just used it and now, now I can't go through the door again. That doesn't even make sense. But it is not in my inventory. I mean, it wouldn't be in my inventory, I suppose, if I left... Oh, there we go. Okay. And so we come to the end of Disc 2 as Laura begins to enter the Fall Tower and her little in neck inflammation is getting worse. So, Laura's an android. She has an alien in her neck and she's all alone now as she enters the Fall Tower to attempt to reach the mini spacecraft and escape. I'll see you next time for the last part of Let's Play Enemy Zero. I'll see you then. Some of Kenji Ino's games came with some pretty weird stuff. Short Warp, for instance, came with a Warp-branded condom. The inclusion of this caused the manufacturing cost of the package to increase, and due to this, the game only had a limited release of 10,000 copies. Eno numbered each one by hand. Real Sound came with a few extras, like a series of cards with images of clouds, a manual in braille, which only makes sense, and a packet of herb seeds, you know, to plant while you're playing real sound. When it comes to extras though, the record goes to Enemy Zero. And by that, I do actually mean that it was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most exclusive special edition, due to only 20 of these being released. This crate cost 200,000 yen, and came with a whole bunch of items. The list is... The game itself... The outfit worn by Warp's Booth Girls at the 1996 Tokyo Game Show... A towel with the Enemy Zero logo. A model of an enemy that apparently had bodily fluid. A metallic bookmark. A flyer and ticket to an Enemy Zero art exhibit in 1996. A set of press releases for Enemy Zero. A videotape of Enemy Zero music clips. A lenticular sheet, don't know what was on it. A set of stickers. An Enemy Zero t-shirt. 
a replica of the first gun that you get in Enemy Zero. Design documents for the game. Floppy disks, envelopes, and paper bags branded with the Warp logo. And a Saturn-stamped CDR, which apparently had an earlier version of Enemy Zero on it. But the greatest pre-order bonus of all came outside the crate. The reason that there were only 20 limited editions sold was that Kenji Ino hand-delivered each one to the buyer. That's right, Kenji Ino would come to your home. <laughs>